Friends, if I could have your attention for a moment. On behalf of the family, I want to thank everybody for joining us here in the chapel and those of us who are joining us for the live stream for the services of Dr. Arthur Weiss. Just a gentle reminder, if anybody does have a phone, please take a moment to turn it on silent. Officiating our service today is Rabbi Andrea London. First, we're going to have the members from the Navy perform the military honor honors.
detail. Final party, salute. Ready, two. Left, face. As we gather today to mourn the loss of Arthur Weiss, we also thank God for the incredible 97 years of his life. Not only did he honorably serve our country in the Navy, arriving in Japan at the end of the Second World War, shortly after the bombings there, but to have a distinguished career as a scientist, and to be the progenitor of this amazing family sitting here. Art Weiss lived an incredible, a full, and a successful life. For all these blessings, O oh God, we give our thanks to you at this time of grief and of sorrow. Shiviti Adonai l'negdi tamid, ki mimini balamot, l'chen samach libi ve'egel kevodi, apesor yishkon l'vetach. I have set the eternal always before me. God is at my side, I shall not be moved. Therefore does my heart exult and my soul rejoice. My being is secure, for you will not abandon me to death, nor let your faithful ones see destruction. You show me the path, of life, your presence brings fullness of joy, enduring happiness is your gift. Death has taken our beloved art. Our friends grieve in their darkened world. In their silence, there is lamentation. In their tears, there is loneliness. Lost in their sorrow, may, may they find the presence of loving friends. Hear them, O God, be with them. For art's love that united us in life and which death cannot sever. For his companionship that we shared along life's path and which continues through the tenderness of memory. For the gifts of his heart and mind that brought us joy and happiness and is now a precious remembrance. For all these and more, we give our thanks to God. In this time of grief, we listen to the voice of our sacred scriptures that brings us the ever new message of God's nearness. It tells us of our kinship with the Creator, and light is in darkness, and joy is in sorrow, and life as in death. Adonai roi lo achsar, binoteshi yarbitseni, almei minuchot yinahaleni, nashi o shavev yancheni vamaglei tzedek lema anshemo, gam ki elech begeit salmavat lo yuchara ki eta imadi, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He guideth me in straight paths for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod on thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou hast anointed my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The kozman be'in l'chochefetz tachat it la led it, beit la moot. It la tat beit la kor natua. In the book of Ecclesiastes, we learn that for everything there is a season, 
a time for every experience under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot what is planted, a time to tear down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to grieve and a time to dance, a time to throw stones and a time to gather stones, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to discard, a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak. Now as we reflect on the life of Dr. Arthur Weiss, I invite his daughter, Deb, to speak. My dad was a scientist. That was how he approached most things. Carefully observing, measuring, listening, and formulating novel solutions. At work and in his basement workshop where he built and fixed all kinds of things, he asked insightful questions. He was never the loudest voice in the room, though. He read widely, scientific journals, novels, history books, magazines, up until a very short time ago. He held very strong convictions and supported a myriad of social causes and cultural institutions. Since I informed my dad's scientific family of his passing, I've received many, many messages. It is amazing how similar most of the comments are. Those who trained in his own lab spoke of his skill as a mentor and a teacher. He taught them how to think like a scientist, to be sure of their results, and to think creatively about their interpretations. Many said they met him in a meeting in front of a poster of their work early in their careers. Initially, they were terrified that a giant in the field might ask them uncomfortable questions. Instead, they found a warm and generous man who provided good counsel and unfailing encouragement. He formed many lifelong friendships with his colleagues, accumulating them at Northwestern and around the world. He was especially supportive of female scientists from the start, something not common among his male peers in the early days. I'm proud to say that I can count myself among this group. Of course, he and mom came to my PhD thesis defense, but then he asked me to repeat it for his own research group when I came to Chicago the following week for my wedding. <laughs> My parents visited St. Louis for Thanksgiving most years. While mom stayed home with my sons, the day before the holiday, dad usually came to work with me, setting up shop in my office or an empty desk nearby. He was always writing something, editing something, providing critiques. A couple of times, he also gave formal lectures for the series that I organized. I'm pretty sure that my dad read every paper that I published up until just a few years ago. He never tried to push me in any particular direction. Memorably, in my senior year of high school, a close family friend tried to get him to voice an opinion about my college choices at a Passover Seder. Mm -hmm. He completely demurred, saying it was my choice, and he meant it. He also did not push me toward any particular graduate degree. However, when I was in college at Princeton, he brought me to Philadelphia to have dinner with some of his colleagues who spoke about the power of a dual MD-PhD program and allowed me to decide for myself that this was indeed the right path for me. I know that he was incredibly proud of my accomplishments. Although honestly, I don't think I will ever write as many papers or have as many citations as him. A colleague emailed yesterday that he ranks among the top 1% of 8 million publishing scientists. However, I don't want to leave the impression that my dad was focused only on work was always home and top for dinner. He was extremely devoted to my mother, to whom he was married for 61 years, as well as my sisters and I and his seven grandchildren. As you may remember, mom was a strong woman with definite opinions, and mostly dad just went along. I can remember only a few times when he snapped back very mildly and never had a loud argument. That just wasn't him. He loved to buy her jewelry. 
Together, they had a very lively social life with many couples' friends, eating out and hosting those 70s dinner parties at which my sisters and I passed out appetizers like cheese puffs and chopped liver and pumpernickel. They had season tickets to the symphony, the opera, the theater, and musicals. Mom and dad were art lovers too, going to museums and finding lots of art fairs at which they accumulated quite a houseful of unique items. My parents' other passion was travel. They were very adventurous. Before my sisters were born, they took a ship to Europe and saw many countries. Having children didn't stop them, though. We had many a road trip to my aunt and uncles in Albany, up to Eagle River, Wisconsin, with Aunt Charlotte and her family, and to many other places, often where my dad had a meeting. My sisters went to Europe before I was even born, but I remember well another European trip when I was seven. Since my sisters are seven and eight years older than I am, I also had many trips in which I was an only child, including to Australia. After my sisters and I moved away from home, our parents traveled even more widely, including Thailand, the Galapagos Islands, and even Antarctica. I was the baby, admittedly a daddy's girl. Even if dad went downstairs to get some work done after dinner, he always came up to read and tell me bedtime stories, or at one point even to write our own together. We played catch, frisbee, or badminton in the backyard. And for a special treat, came to Evanston to climb on the rocks by the lake. I always felt like dad made time for me, even though it was pretty often that I'd be at my friend Lori's after school, and she would ask if I could stay for dinner, a common occurrence. But I'd say, no, my dad's out of town, so I should have dinner with mom. She would then ask where he was. Most of the time, I would shrug and say I had no idea. Maybe Washington, DC, or Israel, or maybe it was France. Didn't much matter to me. And I knew that he would often bring back something interesting, a book, a stuffed animal from my collection, or once, some tracing paper that I used to pull my favorite characters out of Dr. Seuss books for a long time. He knew me so well. After talking with family, friends, and colleagues in the past weeks, I think that his superpower was making everyone feel that way. Thank you, Deb. That was just beautiful. And as we've heard, Art's life was full and incredibly successful on all fronts. Not only a prolific career as a professor at Northwestern studying the structure of connective tissue, he continued in his work traveling to give papers until he was 90 years old. So I understand one of his last trips to a conference his grandson, Josh, traveled with him to Germany so that he could present a scientific paper. Most importantly, Art, as Deb said, was loved by all. His children, his grandchildren, his students, his colleagues. In addition to his work, he had so many hobbies we've heard about. He was a prolific reader. He was a woodworker, liked to tinker and fix things, making furniture, including built-in desks for his daughters and a chess set. He also liked to watch British detective shows in addition to his highbrow opera and symphony that he enjoyed. And he loved Northwestern football. He attended games for 50 years in any kind of weather, mostly, of course, when Northwestern was losing, but he didn't care. He used to enjoy going with Mark and Sharon and his grandson, Ben, often. Art was not one to do much cooking, but he was known for being the grill master and the breakfast chef. Art made the best matzo meal pancakes. He was engaged in his community as well, as we have heard, actively involved at Temple Judea, Shabbat dinners, high holidays, seders were an important part of his life as well. He was born in Pittsburgh in 1925. He had one sister who also lived to 97 years old. He moved with his family in the Depression to Chicago, and from there stayed a diehard Chicagoan for the rest of his life. After graduating high school in 1943, he spent a year in college prior to joining the Navy. After officer training, he ended up on the USS Baltimore, first helping planes take off and land. He arrived in Japan just as the war ended, 
and ran the Navy taxi service between vessels and shore and gave tours of some of the bomb sites. Once home, he completed college and moved to Chicago for his PhD at Northwestern University. It was at a Hillel dance that he met Eve, his beloved wife of 61 years. They married in 1951 and moved to Oklahoma for his postdoc studies, returning to Chicago in 1952. They moved to Skokie and there built a home and raised three daughters, Sharon, Judy, and Deb. Art joined the faculty at Northwestern in 1960, teaching, mentoring numerous PhD students and studying the structure of connective tissue. And as I said, not fully retiring until 90 years old and his mind was still sharp then. He started a conference in his field in 1981. And just four years ago in June, he went to Vancouver to give a lecture. As we heard, he and Eve enjoyed many travels together. Often there would be a travel to go to a conference and then they would stay traveling all over the world, delivering papers all over the world, especially enjoying sabbatical time in Israel. And when he moved to the Mather nine years ago, Art continued to be active. He was the head of the men's club. He attended the Science Cafe, which I understand there would be conversation about some scientific topic, followed by drinks. And he drove until COVID. And just last Thanksgiving, he traveled to St. Louis, as was his tradition, as Deb spoke about, to be with her family for Thanksgiving dinner. And he still enjoyed carving the turkey. As we say goodbye to him today and thank God for his life, we know that the loss is profound for his daughters, for Sharon, for Judy and Deb, and his grandchildren, Justin, Noah, Zoe, Brian, Sarah, Joshua, and Benjamin, for his sons-in-law, Andrew and Mark. He leaves a tremendous legacy for us as we remember him. He was a good mentor and teacher an ethical person, and he was accepting of people for who they were, letting people do what they wanted to do in life, not forcing them to go to a particular school or take a particular path. He wanted people to be who they needed to be. Art was not a person who enjoyed speaking on the phone very much. He usually left that up to Eve. But when he would be on the phone, instead of saying goodbye to his family, he would always say to them, be good. And so as we remember him now, we remember that legacy, and we think about how good he was in his life, intellectually, as a family person, as a good and upright human being. His life was truly a blessing, and we pray today that his memory will continue to bless us. As we share the stories about his life, and we live by his legacy. Psalm 15 speaks of the life that Art Weiss lived. Adonai mi ogobo olecha mi shkon bahar kodshecha, olech tamim ufoel tzedek vedover emet bilvavo. Eternal God, who may abide in your house, who may dwell in your holy mountain, those who are upright, who do justly, who speak the truth within their hearts, who do not slander others or wrong them or bring shame upon them, who scorn the lawless but honor those who revere, who revere God, who give their word and come what may do not retract, who do not exploit others, who do not take bribes, those who live in this way shall never be shaken. Our advice lived an upright life, steady and kind, generous and loving. Oh God, we thank you for the 97 years that we had him with us. His memory is a blessing as we remember him now. God, you give us loved ones and make them the strength of our life, the light of our eyes. They depart and leave us bereft on a lonely way, but you are the living fountain from which our healing flows. To the stricken look for comfort and the sorrow laden for consolation. O oh God, we see life as through windows that open on eternity. 
We see that love endures and the soul endures as you, O God, endure forever. We see that the years are more than grass that withers, more than flowers that fade. They weave a timeless pattern in a world that is the dwelling place of your love and glory. Please take a moment now to offer in your heart a prayer for Dr. Arthur Weiss and for his loving family. We rise as we are able for El Malera Hamim, the memorial prayer. El Malera Hamim Shochen Bam Romim, Om Semenuchan Honatachar Kanfea Shrina, Im Krushimutorum Zora, Rikia Masirim, Et Nishmat, Avraham Ben Mordechai Vesara, Shalach La Olamom, Balhara Hamim, Yasreho, Vesetter Kanapav La Olamim, Vitra Vitra Hayim Et Nishmato. Adonai hu nachalato, v'yanuach b'shalom al mishkavo v'nomar amen. Compassionate God, eternal spirit of the universe, grant perfect rest in your sheltering presence to Dr. Arthur Weiss, son of Fred and Sarah, who has entered eternity. O God of mercy, let him find refuge in your eternal presence and let his soul be bound up in the bond of everlasting life. God is his inheritance. May he rest in peace, and let us say, Amen. Please be seated. Friends, this concludes our service here at the chapel. The will take place immediately at the family plot at Shalom Memorial Park in Arlington Heights. The family will be sitting shiva at the Vice Blumenth Blumenthal Residence, 8950 Lincolnwood Drive, today and tomorrow evenings from 6.30 p.m. to 9 p.m. with services at 7.30 p.m. Memorial contributions in Dr. Weiss's memory can be made to the Greater Chicago Food Depository and the Eve and Arthur Weiss PhD Scholarship Fund at Northwestern's Feinberg School of Medicine. That information, um, as well as some information, is available on the service folder received on the way in. If you do not receive one, they're available on the way out, and for those of you who are on the live stream, that information is on the Funeral Home website. For those joining us in procession to the cemetery, one will be forming outside the parking lot. Please make sure your bright lights and your hazard lights on are at all times when in procession. Please make sure you obtain an orange funeral safety sticker to place on the inside portion of your windshield, as well as magnetic flag to place on the rooftop portion of your vehicle. Please drive as closely to the car in front of you as safety permits. For an additional measure of safety, we will try and have a tail car behind at all times, uh, but please try to limit the use of cell phones and try to use your horn liberally, especially when going through intersections. The following individuals have been asked to serve as pallbearers. They are Dr. Weiss's grandchildren. When I call your name, if you could stand next to Dr. Weiss's casket. Justin, Noah, Zoe, Brian, Sarah, Joshua and Benjamin. So I'd ask everyone to please rise at this time as we escort the casket, the family, and the rabbi from the chapel.